let me just thank you, Professor Kalani, for a very interesting historical and inspiring perspective. Actually, you did have a few minutes to spare, but um, by the time we get set up, I guess we'll be, for the next speaker, we'll be exactly on schedule. So the next speaker is sort of a primer by the Honorable Douglas Roach, who is a former member of parliament and ambassador in various capacities. Um, and he's going to give us a primer on what do we know about nuclear weapons. Okay, so it's all yours. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. A special salute to Madam Spencer. Um, I'm going to say a few words to the chairman on the nuclear weapons, uh, but in just 30 seconds before I get to, to my subject, I came here because I was greatly attracted by Meta's idea of the integration of the mainline subjects uh, for planetary survival. I support this thesis immensely. And I think that uh, we should take some heart, even though I'm sure the following speakers, as I will do, will point to a lot of the negative things in our in these respective fields that are impairing human human security. Nonetheless, the very development of this agenda and the awakening of a global conscience uh, around the world to millions upon millions of people in civil society groups and and a few governments. Um, is a sign of hope and a sign of the times that this global conscience awakening to the needs of a, a one humanity on one planet is a powerful, powerful idea that needs to be built on. So I have the task of spending a minute or two on nuclear weapons. And I consider in the list matter of the six main subjects without any derogation of the importance of the other five, that nuclear weapons is the singular subject uh, that uh, threatens an immediate massive destruction of the world. And I call as my first witness, the Secretary General, of the United Nations, uh, Mr. Antonio Guterres, who last week in Geneva uh, uh, released his agenda for disarmament. And it's a fairly lengthy document. Uh, it's called Securing Our Common Future. And it deals in great detail with the nuclear weapons threat. And in delivering his, uh, his uh, agenda, uh, the Secretary General uttered the following sentence. And I would like uh, to ask you respectfully to listen carefully to the words of this sentence, the Secretary General. We are one mechanical, electronic, or human error away from a catastrophe that could eradicate entire cities from the map. That is a terrifying message. And um, unfortunately, all too true, when one considers the very loose, irresponsible, dangerous methods employed by leading politicians today in the fulfillment of their, of their, uh, so their, their responsibilities. Uh, they have responsibilities to, to humankind, and they have just swept those responsibilities aside. It is, it is absolutely outrageous that the five permanent members of the Security Council, who are the five uh, nuclear weapon states, the original five and plus four more now, but the primary, they hold prime, as members of the Security Council, they hold the primary responsibility for peace and security in the world. And I repeat that it is, it is outrageous 
that they have not, and not only not not only have they not lived up to their obligations under Article Six of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, which enjoins them to pursue in good faith negotiations uh, toward the elimination of nuclear weapons, um, a, uh, an imperative that was reinforced by the International Court of Justice in 1996, which said that all states have an obligation not only to pursue, but to conclude negotiations. Not only are they in violation of that, but they are now directly opposing the steps that the humanitarian movement which arose in the latter years as a result in front of the frustration that we're feeling because major powers are ignoring their responsibilities. So they're boycotting the process, and that's not good enough for a singular or a five boycott, but they have pressured, in the case of the United States, pressured officially in a letter, and I have to say, in Fairness to the truth, um, a letter that was dated October 2016, which is to say prior to the election of Mr. Trump, the American government uh, commanded its NATO partners to oppose the um, then <coughs> discussions leading to a resolution in the in the General Assembly which established the mandate for the process to produce the treaty. To oppose that, to absent themselves, to boycott. And those Canada fell in line, very sadly, very sadly so. So we have a very big uh, challenge to, uh, to, uh, to, to face here. Now, Meta has asked be brief, so he asked me to be brief, and so this whole text is only three pages, so you can see that it's, it's not going to be a big, long thing on nuclear weapons. But so I tried to find um, a, a short, you know, a succinct expression of um, uh, of uh, the situation. So I went back, as uh, John Polanyi did, into a little bit of history. And it was in the 1980s, uh, prior to the Reykjavik summit, the famous Reykjavik summit, in which President Ronald Reagan on behalf of the United States, and President Mikhail Gorbachev on behalf of the African Soviet Union, uh, almost came to a decision to abolish nuclear weapons, much to the horror and consternation of their officials on, on both sides. But in any event, just prior to that, both Reagan and Gorbachev uttered 12 words that have gone down in history and ought to be repeated and drilled into the mind of every politician on the planet. And these 12 words are, a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. There's a lot of wisdom in that. But if states cannot agree yet on exactly what constitutes nuclear disarmament, disarmament measures, non-proliferation measures, and all the, all the, the fine points that, uh, that, uh, that uh, this situation contains, but they cannot agree on, surely they can agree on the catastrophic humanitarian consequences that would result from the use of any nuclear weapon, and thus the need to eliminate such weapons. And so that, uh, that, um, uh, has uh, uh, I think, in, in, impelled the Secretary General to make his appeal, and of course, the, the Mr. Guterres is a very is in a very constrained position himself. It is not as if he has any magic button to compel the uh, the, the nuclear weapon states to uh, to uh, to take the appropriate action. He can only make an appeal to the world. And so, when Mr. Guterres is, is gave those words uh, in releasing his report. You know, there were only one mechanical moment from, from a catastrophe. I felt that he was speaking to me. And my dear friends, he was speaking to you. And so it is up to us to make an impression on our own government. In, in you know, the ways that are open to us, limited as they may be. But um, we need to get through to them and the officials in Ottawa and the uh, 
Uh, at one stage of my life, I was one of them, and thus I have an understanding of uh, what goes on in the, in the process of uh, public policy making. As uh, that has is important to do here, to, to the setting of public policy and, and the constraints even that they are under, but they uh, need to recognize that. Uh, the message that we are trying to convey to them is that the only guarantee that nuclear weapons will never be used again is with verified or elimination. And thus that process needs to be continually shored up, particularly in today's climate, when it, we've now lived with nuclear weapons so long. And I mean, I, a couple of years ago, I went across Canada and spoke in 22 universities to students on the very subject. And I, I came away with an impression that a whole new generation is coming on stream for whom nuclear weapons are but part of the furniture of life. I mean, to me, they, they are an outrageous aberration from, 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 from a norm of morality and law. But listen, what, what I'm trying to say here is that there are generations coming now that it, the nuclear weapons they, it's just this it's 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 part of the part of the whole process, and we have to turn that around, and so uh, get them to understand how threatened uh, they are themselves in their own lives and aspirations for lives, business, commerce, teaching, religion, anything they're going to do. Everything is jeopardized by the threat of a uh, nuclear weapon, in which. Uh, not only are there 15,000 of them still in existence, but 1,100 or 1,500 are still on, on constant alert status, meaning they can be they can be fired on 15 minutes notice. And uh, President, former President Jimmy Carter, whom I've gotten to know in my work quite well, and, 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 and he, Mr. Carter is wringing his hands at me. No official, a president or whatever, official who has to decide in 15 minutes if he's going to retaliate because some some sign came through a computer that there's an attack on the way, and we all know that there's been accidents galore in this field. So it is, it, it simply boggles our mind. <clears throat> and here in a community under the auspices of science, for peace, science that understands, you know, how everything works and what, that we would allow the political process to so deny our humanity. Well, that ought to keep, uh, keep us uh, going. Um, this new nuclear arms race now, of course, is underway. We have to, we have to recognize that. Um, the nuclear weapon states are modernizing their, uh, their, 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 we their weapons. And I would like to say this with respect to the United States. We all think, well, the midterm elections are, you know, come, will come along and then, uh, and then maybe Trump will go down, or whatever, da 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 da. Last week, the United States Congress adopted, passed formally, the U.S. Defense Budget Bill authorizing $771 billion. That's higher than it's ever been, and it's higher than all the next 10, 15 states all put together. We know all that. But what struck me in reading about that action was that um, 120 Democrats in the Congress joined Republicans in adopting our measure. That is to say, the militarization of, of uh, security is so widespread and complete in the United States that it is not any longer a partisan issue that will be resolved by the election of the Democrats or Republicans. It's ingrained into their system. This is a problem that we have to deal with. And the new United States Nuclear Posture Review that was published under, under the auspices of the Trump administration will institutionalize the military doctrine of nuclear deterrence as a permanent feature of the great power relations 
And for the first time, the United States it now threatens to use a nuclear response to combat non-nuclear aggression. This has never been heard of before. In all the work that I was part of on behalf of the Canadian government years ago, and, and the work that has brought us in almost in, into this future, it was, it was on, a, on, a, on, a, on a principle that nuclear weapons would never be used against a non-nuclear state, or they would never be used in a non, for a non-nuclear attack. I mean, they were reserved as a deterrent against a nuclear attack. Mm -hmm. But that threshold has been crossed, the, 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 the norm has been lowered. And so this is a very dangerous moment that the, uh, that the world has entered. And people do not know it. People have no idea. I talk to my friends, and then they, they don't have no idea. Friends are smart people, they're, they're experts in anything I know nothing about. They, they don't know anything about this subject. How is it possible that the subject of which I am now discussing is so little known on the main street or the media? Well, it, uh, I leave that to you to ponder. The chairman will be informing me in a moment that I should get off this stage. So I leave that question with you. But the treaty has now given us a new sense of hope. The Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, signed by 122 states on July the 7th, 2017. It requires 50 states, the ratification of 50 states to enter into force. It's now been ratified by about eight or nine or something, and it's moving along the process. And it will come into force, I suppose, in the normal process in a couple of years. And at that time, those who signed the treaty will have recognized the, that the very possession of nuclear weapons, not just their threat or the use of threat. The very possession of nuclear weapons is illegal. And of course, this is why the United States is fighting tooth and nail not to be put into, a, into such a position where they have no moral base, no legal base, and the Catholic Church in the United States will be put into a very difficult position as a result of Pope Francis's statement uh, coming out in, in, on November the 10th, 2017, at a conference in Rome, which I attended, in which Pope Francis said, and I quote him directly, um, uh, uh, the very possession of nuclear weapons is to be firmly condemned. <coughs> That's at the heart of the Prohibition Treaty. The OEC signed the treaty and ratified it. And so now we come to Canada. You say, well, why shouldn't Canada sign uh, the treaty. Because Canada recognizes not just the, the pressure of the United States, you can talk all day long if you want about will this affect NAFTA or not, I don't know whether it will or not, it never has in the past. But in any event, in Canada, the Canadian government is put in the position now, um, if, it, if it recognizes and signs the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, that Canada will be turning its back on, on the military doctrine of nuclear deterrence. And at the Non-Proliferation Treaty Preparatory Meeting in, in uh, Geneva a couple of weeks ago, the Canadian government said, much to my horror, said, we are continuing to rely on nuclear deterrence. Mm -hmm. So the issue is joined. Are we going to go forward with nuclear deterrence as the basis of our policy? Oh yes, we want nuclear disarmament, but we're we still going to support nuclear deterrence? Or are we going to change? So one would hope that Canada uh, would um, summon up uh, some uh, courage, uh, some intellectual integrity, and uh, recognize that the arguments that they have been producing, and uh, I will put on the floor of the House of Commons uh, in a one-day debate, the, the arguments uh, uh, are bogus. That the, the treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons is premature. It's going to interfere with the non-proliferation treaty. I mean, that bogus arguments. So we have to break through and say that Canada should join the, the treaty, sign the treaty, and simultaneously work with NATO to change its policies. NATO continuing to say, how did NATO have the audacity? to say that nuclear weapons are the supreme guarantee of our security on the one hand, and on the other hand say, oh yeah, we're gonna support the non-proliferation treaty 
which in Article 6 says you have to negotiate the elimination. I mean, this barefaced dichotomy, I mean, it's, 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 it's shocking. We ought not to stand for this. And groups like this need to have our voice multiplied. So North Korea and uh, Iran are in the headlines. They are the focal point of whatever attention is given to this. And naturally, both should be resolved. We don't want a catastrophe in either region. And uh, in, in diplomatic action, new, responsible diplomatic action can resolve the issues of uh, North Korea and Iran. And uh, in a pressure period, we can get into more detail on that. But regardless, regardless of what happens in Iran or North Korea, a fundamental problem is left to us. That problem is that the powerful states arrogate unto themselves the right to possess and threaten to use nuclear weapons while proscribing their acquisition by any other state. In other words, I can have my nuclear weapons, but you cannot have yours. This is not a viable policy. Mm -hmm. and, and the states that produce the Prohibition Treaty are trying to say that. This is a discriminatory policy, it's not viable, and it won't survive. So, Mr. Guterres has appealed to us for action, and I make my appeal here. The United States and Russia, of course, have the primary responsibility. They have most of the nuclear weapons. Uh, but other states must help them. That's written right into the Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conferences. All states must participate in the denuclearization of military policies of, of the world. So we have an immense responsibility and the job of, evolves then onto us as civil society leaders. And the, 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 the room is filled with them. Filled with, with, with leaders uh, to, to demand meaningful government action on our part in Ottawa uh, to eliminate nuclear weapons in a verifiable, time bound manner. Now, one final little PS next year is a federal election in Canada. And so, if, any, if ever politicians are vulnerable, it's at election time. And so, I, I'm calling on the process to start to get all the political parties, every political party in Canada to ascribe, you know, to nuclear disarmament uh, in a verifiable time-bound manner and to demand, uh, uh, to put in their party policy platforms that they uh, will commit themselves to signing the Prohibition Treaty and work to change NATO's outmoded nuclear weapons policies. Canada must renounce the erroneous uh, policy of nuclear deterrence. So, can we do this? Can we inject courage into the Canadian political system? Bravo. Bravo.